Okay, this is physics education messed up by relativity. What I'm going to refer to is an article called Teaching Special Relativity Minkowski Tr Trumps Einstein, and that's by Richard Con Henry. And the link is there. And that's a description of uh, Richard Con Henry there. And I'm going to be referring to another article called Meeting the Physicist Who Wants to Build a Time Machine, the Cunami Hate with Stead Father, and that's at that place there. And basically the conclusion is going to be uh, the Hall of Physics Education has degenerated into nonsense, and of course it's because of Einstein. So physics education messed up by relativity. So we go to it now. This is it. This is in Wikipedia. It's Richard Con Henry, and coming over, uh, born 1940, is professor of physics and astronomy at Johns Hopkins University. Author of one book and over 200 publications on the topics of astrophysics, etc. So, go to his article. It's called. Uh, Teaching Special Relativity uh, Minkowski Trumps Einstein uh, by Richard Cole Henry. So uh, he's basically complaining about physics education. Let's see. Uh, right. If I can get a better marker. Uh, Physics students, no, students find physics difficult. I'm thinking of first year undergraduate university physics majors. I found it difficult myself and it took me almost 40 years of teaching physics to fully understand the reasons for the perceived difficulty. So it's a problem in teaching physics once again. And I'm blaming Einstein, but, but uh, not everybody's looking at it from that perspective. He's, he's recognised there's a problem of physics education, and he wants to sort it out. Why do fit students who find mathematics easy to understand find physics difficult to understand? Well, from my point of view, the maths has been messed up by Einstein. It's, uh, if we go to my uh, go to my videos, uh, and when I come back to you later. I've got my videos here. Yeah, that one. When you look at the when you look at the mathematics it's being used by Einstein's relativity, it is nonsense. And so no wonder you are having the problem then with students who find mathematics easy, find physics difficult to understand because it's the math is nonsense. There are two parts to the answer. First and most importantly, by understand, students mean fit into my existing correct understanding of what the world is. So he's not really looking at it from the perspective that the maths has been messed up in physics, so he's thinking in a different way. He's thinking that uh, students are believing things which are wrong. Well, I, I, I don't think so. From my point of view, if the student believes in Newtonian physics and the maths associated with Newtonian physics, then they're coming into university and they're finding out that all the maths has been messed up by Einstein and it's nonsense. So they should be allowed to reach a valid conclusion that what they've been taught is nonsense. Sit, but he's not coming from that way. Since the student's existing understanding of what the world is, is in fact quite incorrect. And since what is correct is almost impossible for the average person to believe, there is a gigantic barrier in understanding physics. So that's summarising it really. From my perspective, uh, they're just talking nonsense in physics education. So. The barrier is, however, entirely psychological, he thinks so. Now, if you were coming into 
coming into physics with a proper understanding of mathematics and Newtonian physics, you are going to be faced with nonsense. Uh, and anyway, carrying on with his point of view, secondly, the physics that they are being taught is not correct physics, it is engineering approximations only. And I think, well, if you're talking about Newtonian physics, then you normally do approximations, so there's nothing wrong with that really. So he's complaining about something which is he's wrong, basically. So not only does what they are being taught not make sense in terms of the student's incorrect worldview, it does not even make sen sense in terms of a correct quantum mechanical worldview. So it's sounding like he's rejecting Newtonian physics and he thinks correct physics is quantum mechanics. I'm not really here to attack quantum mechanics, I'm concentrating on relativity because really the mess in physics starts from relativity and any other mess from quantum mechanics is extra but he's sort of talking from a point of view where he believes quantum mechanics and it seemingly he believes it over better being over Newtonian physics and I've disagreed on that. Newtonian physics does eventually lead to a sort of quantum mechanics from my study of things. <coughs> Yeah, but anyway, proceeding, he's recognised as a mess in physics, he, he carries on. It's a wonder that anyone at all ever sticks to physics and graph sets. So there's this big problem in physics university, a student can come into it and find it doesn't make any sense to him uh, or her, and they're going to give up, they're going to leave. And he, his point of view, uh, Hen, Hen, Richard Con Henry, is that the students believe things is a false and he thinks that's a problem but I'm saying no no if the students understand Newtonian physics and they understand mathematics in the proper way then what they're being faced with at a university on physics is a load of nonsense anyway proceeding with his way of thinking about it he thinks correct physics is of course quantum mechanics quantum mechanics has effortlessly survived intense attacks by the most brilliant of physicists Quantum mechanics will at a minimum be with us for my lifetime and yours. It is the basis of all our current thinking and it provides our current conception of the universe encapsulating the headline, measurements are the only reality, say quantum test. And that's referring to a paper so and so. So, well, I don't want to attack, bother attacking quantum mechanics, that would be going off at a tangent to my attack at relativity. Anyway, proceeding. Non relativistic quantum mechanics leads to Maxwell's equations, which are Lorentz invariant, and that's by Dyson 1990. After quantum mechanics itself, I Minkowski's mean, union of space and time in, into space time is the greatest advance that has ever occurred in our understanding of the nature of the universe. That is, of course, the, of the observations. So, when he's saying that about Minkowski, presumably that's his uh, interpretation. Anyway, we're now going to get on to uh, special relativity, or what I'm complaining about. So, how grotesquely badly we teach special relativity encapsulates the practical problem of teaching physics to the freshman physics major. So, we would agree on that. Teaching uh, special relativity to uh, physics students is awful. It's just terrible. And he's a teacher of it, and he's recognised it's awful. Uh, we kind of diver, diver, uh, diverge on our opinion as to why teaching a special relativity is so bad. <clears throat> I have never found a single freshman physics textbook that teaches Minkowski space time. I have never found a single text on general relativity that mentions Einstein's two postulates. So, I don't know. Um, I think they do, as far as I know, they are students do get taught some stuff about Minkowski space time but I suppose it's not most of them are not coming from that direction so I think it's going off at a tangent a bit there as to general relativity well special relativity you would normally come at it from the post two postulates but general relativity is supposed to be moving on a bit more every 
physics freshman has taught, or let me quote an example, in the fall of 2007 I will for the second time in my career teach introductory physics for physical science major at the Johns Hopkins University. One text that has recently been used for that course is University Physics by R. L. Reeves. On page 1155 we read, uh, this is what presumably he's complaining about, the entire special theory stems from only two postulates. Postulate 1, the speed of light in a vacuum has the same numerical value C when measured in any inertial reference frame independent of the motion of the source and or observer. Postulate 2, the fundamental laws of physics must be the same for all inertial reference frames. So he's going to be calling in horror now. The reader, the reader is invited to recall not only at the bizarre numbering of the infamous two uh, postulates, but of course at the use of the postulates at all. So first of all, the, the postulates are numbered the wrong way out. That's normally postulate one and that's normally postulate two, so they've confused things around the wrong way. But he's going to carry on complaining about something else. Right. So here we go. There is no doubt that historically Albert Einstein in 1905 did introduce two postulates and also that it is he who discovered special relativity. So, yeah, in Einstein's famous paper on special relativity in 1905, he does start off by talking about two postulates. It's this question of discovered special relativity uh, which can be uh, argued against. You've got other people who are dealing with relativity, not just Einstein. Anyway, carrying on. But the second of these postulates, the one concerning the constants you see, just in case Reese has confused you, and it's, the, and it's the speed of light if we go back here. The speed of light in a vacuum has the same fundamental value C when measured by blah, blah, blah. This is really, that should be really postulate too. That's the way they normally number it. did not survive the year. So what? You're saying it didn't survive the year. What? What? That one? That postulate there didn't survive the year. What? What? Huh? In September of 1905, Einstein published his development for relativity, the discovery of the implication that E was empty squared. And in the new paper he mentioned a single postulate only. But the paper contains a sweet footnote. The principle of the constancy of the velocity of light is, of course, contained in Maxwell's equations. How I love that, of course, Einstein is human. So what, uh, what Richard Con Henry is trying to say is, uh, in 1905, the first paper that Einstein wrote uh, stated two postulates, but in the second paper on relativity. Uh, Einstein was only stating one postulate, so he's kind of he's he's then trying to interpret that that the second postulate didn't survive, and so we look at that now. So according to the second paper on relativity, uh, Einstein's making the claim the principle, the constancy of the velocity of light is of course contained in Maxwell equations, and he thinks that's good. Anyway, we go back. Gone too far. There we go, this one. We go into details here. In this video, I'll go into details. Maxwell did not predict special relativity, and the idea of the constancy of the speed of light from Maxwell's theory is not really there. It's just a strange interpretation of Maxwell's theory. So, he's making a false claim. Einstein's making a false claim that the principle of the constancy, the velocity of light, is of course contained in Maxwell's equation. That's a false claim. And it's coming from Einstein. And this person, uh, Richard Con Henry, he's believing a false claim. There's nothing there. It is two postulates.
anyway, continuing on. So I disagree with that. Einstein got it wrong, and uh, this person who's believing this has got it wrong. I do not know if it's true, but I recall being told that during the Middle Ages, undergraduates learned to multiply and divide using Roman numerals, while the exotic Arabic numerals were reserved for the more advanced students. Um, it's a bit of a diversion, but anyway, he's, he's equating uh, teaching of special relativity to being similar to this. That is exactly what we do today in teaching special relativity. Antique postulates that are not of anything but historical interest to general physicists are presented to students as special relativity. So, from his point of view, uh, those two postulates, which are numbered wrong there, are antique. They're not uh, special relativity anymore. So, it's some sort of revision going on here. Some books do better than others in warning students how seemingly impossible the second postulate is. And the second postulate is still about the speed of light, uh, and it is nonsense basically. But all the students, but all have the students working out true but unintuitive consequences, e.g., relativity of uh, simultaneity. Using thought experience, with of course the second postulate producing the bizarre results. Result, it says, but should be results. So, from the second postulate about the speed of light, you just create nonsense basically. And he's saying it's bizarre, bizarre view. So, yep, you, you should, from my point of view, you should conclude that special relativity is nonsense from that, really. But they want, they're, teach, they're teaching these students these things, and, and they want the students to believe it. No matter how nonsense it seems, they want students to believe it. And now he continues. A small number of texts of Haney and Knight and a few others, these are texts on relativity, at least follow Einstein's second paper in having but a single postulate, but none do what needs to be done, which is to drop Einstein and adopt Minkowski. So there are texts that teach relativity, special relativity, a different way, and he's he thinking they want to do it from teaching it from a perspective of Minkowski instead of from Einstein and that's sort of another revision if you're going from most many texts I suppose you're going from 1905 uh, special relativity paper and hence you're getting up with the what he's called call bizarre you get bizarre but still if you're going it from a revision from Minkowski it still doesn't make that much sense if you look into it you try to make sense of what he's saying and what I started saying, it still doesn't make sense together. Right, so anyway, from his point of view, I feel that the time has come to relegate the two postulates to the dustbin of history and to teach special relativity to undergraduates or indeed to middle school students the Minkowski way. So it's a revision to the teaching of special relativity that he wants. <clears throat> I believe it is around grade 9 that students are taught the Pythagorean theorem it is taught as mathematics and no hint is given that the keys to the kingdom are in hand. That happens of course because the teacher does not know special relativity. So <clears throat> I suppose it's a teacher who's not gone on to do a physics degree and they're teaching something uh, and they're not going to touch special relativity because they've not been taught it. All that is additionally required is the recognition that one can, if one wishes, measure distances using imaginary numbers. So, you don't have to use imaginary numbers if you don't want to. If one wishes, if one wishes, yeah, you can use imaginary numbers if you want. And um, and that the same is true for time. What, what, so, you can use imaginary time if you want to. I suppose you can you can use a uh, um, imaginary number full time if you want to. So suddenly suddenly says students react well to the suggestion that time is the fourth dimension. So what we yeah, so so what really? Treating time as a dimension. And then I say can say I can visit Rome but I cannot visit Julius Caesar. So we need some distinction between space and time and suggestions please. So he's offering it to the uh, student to try to work out the next step. 
so it's quite easy to go to Rome I suppose if you've got the money you can travel there and it's a mainly a question of travelling through space but you would have to travel back with some time to go and see Julius Caesar so it's not something that going back to see new Julius Caesar where he's alive is probably not too easy unless you're into Doctor Who Star Trek territory almost always after some Soric prodding I get Use imaginary numbers for one and mill numbers for the other. Uh, but you don't have to use imaginary numbers I've got back here. Uh, what is this requires recognition that one can, if one wishes, measure distance using imaginary numbers. But, so that's an optional for uh, distances and uh, it's optional I suppose if you want to use imaginary numbers for time or not. Uh, but he's wanting wanted them to come to that sort of possibility and then he says I reward the student by announcing you have just discovered Einstein's theory of relativity, special relativity what? no that's nonsense that's, that's not true uh, if we go back to the 1905 paper on special relativity then what you're talking about is two postulates so suddenly he's uh, wanting to drop the second postulate about the speed of light and he's sort of just wanting to go straight on to Minkowski so this is sort of revision he wants to do he wants to uh, drop talking about the uh, postulate about the speed of light being constant and instead going on to the idea of uh, forming a Minkowski space time uh, the notion that the Minkowski metric describes space time is entirely plausible to the students. Well, if I sit in the class, I would de not be agreeing with that. It is not counterintuitive in any way, at least on the, its face. I announced to students that experiment is the test, so I looked at experiments and I don't agree with their interpretation. Right. Once students agree that the Minkowski metric might describe the world, it is of course extremely easy to deduce that if this should be our world, then there must be a limiting velocity. I don't know. He's not going into details about that, but I disagree entirely with all that. He's coming at it from looking at Minkowski space-time with its Minkowski metric, and he's thinking from that you're getting a limit in speed. And no. No, that's wrong. And it's, and it's not the way that Einstein did it anyway. Einstein's coming at it from two postulates. Right. Everything else then follows with ease. And the students emerge comfortable with special relativity as a marvellous insight into the mathematical structure of the observations, the observations that we need naively interpret as a universe. So I disagree with all that. If I was a student now, I wouldn't be agreeing with any of that. So he's just deceived the students, they're just sitting there like vegetables as far as I'm concerned. So we go back to the beginning here and what is going off on this little tangent. And he's saying, I can visit Rome but I cannot cannot visit Julius Caesar. So all this sort of stuff about some needs some distinction between space and time and well you're trying to come up with the idea you can't go backwards in time but that is not what some of the physicists are saying if we go on to this one uh, this article here uh, meet the physicist who wants to build a time machine to communicate with his dead father Go for his introduction bit here. My fundamental goal in life has always been to find a way to build a time machine. <laughs> you got it. So he's a professor of physics and he's believing in some sort of time travel theory. My whole reason for being interested in the topic of time travel has to do with my father, 
My father was the center of my life. To me, he was almost sort of like Superman. He seemed larger than... So it's going on to the diversion a bit there because it's going on to his personal life and the reason he wanted to wants to build a time machine is to go back and see his father before his father died. So it's pretty sad, really. So, but we so get on to the sort of physics from this video. A circulating beam of light, a laser beam. Now, you can't get a laser beam to circulate. There's a number of different ways of doing that. That is to say that you can get a light beam. So, getting on to a bit more of the issue here, he's proposing to send back subatomic particles, a time shuffle machine. So, he's talking about doing it with subatomic particles. To go around and around and around. <coughs> now, what my theory shows based on Einstein's work is that... Einstein, uh, based on Einstein's work, so based on Einstein, he's believing in time travel. At the circulating beam of light will cause... Uh, project based on Einstein's theories. ...cause the twisting of empty space. And you might say, well, uh, how can we understand this, this twisting of empty space by a circulating light beam? Well, it's very easy to illustrate if we think of a cup of coffee. Imagine that the coffee that's in this cup is like empty space. And imagine that the spoon is like the circulating light beam. Now, what happens when I take the spoon and stir the coffee? Well, the coffee, as you can see, swirls around. That's what the circulating light beam is doing to empty space. Okay? Just as the spoon is stirring the coffee, the circulating light beam will stir empty space. But now you might say, well, wait a minute. If it's empty space, how am I going to see it? Well, in the case of the coffee, suppose that I take a little coffee bean and put it in here. You can see what's happening. The coffee bean is being swirled around. So that's how you can see it. Now, in the case, the an analogous situation with empty space is that if I take a little subatomic particle called a neutron and I put the neutron into the space, then as the circulating light beam is stirring the empty space, the little neutron will get swirled around. We will be able to see the neutron being swirled around, so we'll know that the empty space is moving around. That's step one. Now, in Einstein's theory, what's very important to realize is that space and time are linked. Whatever you do to space also happens to time. What this means, then, is that as you're stirring the empty space, and if you stir it strong enough, then time will be twisted. Now, if we think of time as a straight line, say a straight line at the bottom of the line is the past the middle of the line is the present and at the top of the line is the future but if space is being twisted then that straight line will be twisted into a loop now imagine what's happening here we're on a loop so that means if i start out at the past i move along the loop to the present and i continue along the loop but remember i've made that line into a loop so i can go from the past to the present to the future but I'm on this loop so I can go from the future back to the past. So that is the core of the idea. Now, Dr. Millet and his colleagues need to raise a quarter of a million dollars to conduct their space-time twisting experiment, and they're currently seeking both public and private donations. So what do you reckon? That was amazing, though I have to say, I did start to get a little bit lost around about the time of the immersion of the coffee bean into the coffee, possibly because I'm extremely thirsty very early in the morning. Mm. It... So... If that made any sense to you, good luck. But basically, from this per physicist's point of view, you've got some sort of time backwards time travel theory, and sort of like the references you've got here. Have you seen the movie Interstellar? Yeah, it's kind of like that. So you've got these little science fiction things uh, coming in to talking about special relativity. So if this prof if this professor here. Richard Con Henry thinking, oh, the way to come at it is to come at it from the idea that time back with time travel is not possible. And he's, he's starting them off on a thing like saying, where is it? I, I can visit visit Rome, but I cannot visit Julius Caesar. So I so we need some distinction between space and time. What what? So he's trying to get the idea that you approach the subject from saying you can't go backwards in time. But people are looking at Einstein's relativity and thinking, yeah, you can. It's not just this physicist. It's not just him. It's not just him. He's thinking, oh, you can go back some time from using Einstein's relativity as other people as well. So this person who's thinking you can do it from saying, starting from saying you can't go back some time, well, that's nonsense. 
it's not really taking into account how really messed up Einstein's relativity is. He's saying teaching special relativity Minkowski trumps Einstein. Well, no, it doesn't. You've still got that major problem of people reading strange things into it. So we go back to so we go to the conclusion. Basically, the Hall of Physics education has degenerated into nonsense. It's just nonsense. He's trying to think he can rewrite the teaching of special relativity by coming at it from Minkowski instead of from Einstein. No, he can't. It's still nonsense. Still nonsense or deep. Thank you.